More now on the election campaign, because as we've been telling you, four Brexit Party MEPs have quit the party to lend their support to Boris Johnson. They include uh, the sister of the Commons leader, Jacob Rees-Mogg, that's Annunciata uh, Rees-Mogg. Let's uh, listen in. If Boris Johnson's deal is good enough to stand down 317 candidates and not fight the Tories in their existing seats, why on earth are we competing with them elsewhere? In fairness, the Tories could probably have been uh, more generous to the Brexit party after its role in securing a new leader in Boris, but we shouldn't let pride get in the way of delivering the outcome of the referendum. Boris has a fine line to tread uh, to keep those on side who voted Remain but believe foremost in democracy, and those who might switch to the Lib Dems and in so doing risk a Corbyn-led alliance. We should be more intelligent and sensitive to this, or we risk no Brexit at all. After all, if the consequence of the Brexit party is to deny us pro-Brexit MPs in just a dozen seats, we could see a new occupant in number 10. Having stood alongside Boris Johnson at Vote Leave during the referendum and alongside Nigel Farage in the Brexit party, I can assure you that both are equally committed to delivering Brexit. One might say that Boris has the tougher task as he has to carry non-believers and make the hard choices that government involves. In spite of this, it was due to Boris's excellent card play and poker-style bluff that the EU caved in on the backstop and agreed significant changes to the political declaration. The 27 couldn't be certain whether Boris would sign that extension letter or whether he would break the law. The key thing going forward is not the withdrawal deal, but appointing a new, streetwise and commercially experienced negotiating team, or teams with an S, um, and comprising only those who share the positive vision for Brexit. We should be negotiating deals simultaneously with the United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, whilst also forging ahead with the EU. Each negotiation will help strengthen the other. Now, I joined the Brexit party earlier this year when Theresa May crossed a red line. She invited Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Streets to discuss a cross-party solution to Brexit and for the future of our country. I knew at that point she'd lost the plot. One moment she branded Corbyn unfit to lead, the next she provided him with unprecedented credibility. I said then he was an anti-Semitic Marxist who I could never support, but now we know even more. Corbyn is dishonest over his tax promises. He's incoherent over Brexit. He will be weak with our security and the threats we face, and he will bankrupt the country faster than you could say Venezuela. Everyone knows that the reason for the austerity our country had endured was because Labour left the cupboards bare after 13 years in power, and they are promising the same again now. In fact, far, far worse. With their fairy tale offers of free this, free that, and free the other, once this is, election is over, the only thing we want free is to be free of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, despite resigning the whip, the Brexit Party whip, I, I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues in wanting to make one thing very clear. My decision is nothing personal towards Nigel Farage. It is largely due to his vision and persistence that becoming an independent country has moved over the past 20 years from being a, free, a fringe issue to a mainstream government policy. It has been a towering achievement, and he can stand proudly as one of the most influential political leaders of my lifetime. Now is the time to cement this legacy. Nigel should celebrate his victory, not put it at peril. Now, whilst this is not strictly Brexit related, I do hope you will indulge me with a short personal tale. When I was 15 and studying history at school, part of the curriculum was the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1930s. A documentary film called Hitler happened to be showing that year with original footage in some cinemas and which a school friend and I thought would be quite helpful for our course. We entered the cinema and took our seats. What we didn't realise until the film started was that the entire auditorium was filled with leather-clad National Front thugs and skinheads. When the word Jew was mentioned, the audience started jeering. When a Jewish woman appeared on screen, they shouted, whore. My friend and I were petrified. As much as anything, petrified the thugs might notice we weren't participating. So God help me, we joined in. The son of a Holocaust survivor jeering at Jews to protect himself. Think about that. 
When the movie ended, many in the audience stood up, gave Nazi salutes and shouted, We'll be back! We slid away, shivering with fear, hoping no one would spot us. That awful memory had been totally erased from my mind for over 40 years until last Sunday. On Sunday, I saw on social media some footage of Matt Hancock, who is not Jewish, saying at a hustings that his worst fear of Labour was the rise in anti-Semitism. The moment he said that, the Labour supporters who filled the room stood up jeering and mocking, truly vile, with real hatred in their voices. After 40 years, a genuine fear was awakened in me. Jewish people in Britain do not fear Corbyn. We know precisely who he is and what he stands for. What we fear is living in a country that is so unconcerned with anti-Semitic racism that such a man can be elected. That is the nightmare we are facing. We need to vote Conservative now for three reasons. Mm. Because a vote for the Brexit Party or the So Labour that party is uh, Lance splitting the Foreman, uh, formerly of the Brexit Party, as of today, along with three of his MEP Brexit Party colleagues. They have resigned the Brexit Party whip uh, in order to support the Conservatives in the election.